Thank you, John, and thanks very much for the invitation to, um, to be here. And uh, uh, thank you so much as well to the uh, University of Ulster for the um, warmth and hospitality that I've experienced in, in coming here, which is my first time uh, to Northern Ireland, and it's a, a, a pleasure to be here. Quite extraordinary to have a minister for just three universities. I wish we did. Um, <laughs> we might get this to a little bit more. <laughs> um, but, uh, so that's a great model for the future. Um, as John said, I was asked to, to come along and talk. It's a privilege to be able to do so. It's always a, always a pleasure to be able to reconnect, at least uh, even if only briefly, um, with uh, a group of practitioners who do the real work in higher education. And um, that's always important for someone like me because we have this difficulty of connecting to what actually happens uh, in, in, in practice. And so it's important to be able to participate in this. Um, I um, was asked to speak about um, widening participation in divided communities. I wasn't quite sure whether John had in mind uh, when he was thinking about that, uh, divided communities in South Africa or divided, divided communities in Britain. So I decided to talk about both and to compare them. Um, I, I know from the, um, from, from the delegate list that there are at least two fellow South Africans in the audience. I don't exactly know who they are, but they can keep quiet and, uh, and see whether or not they agree with my comments on South African higher education. But what I found, and a personal note before I start on the paper, is that when I, when I, I came here, I, 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 as I'm going to say at the end, I thought that uh, I was going into um, a very different system. I hadn't been in British higher education since the 1970s. And uh, after I relocated to Salford from Cape Town on behalf of, well, because of the weather, basically, I um, 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 have <laughs> found, um, found that uh, the systems have remarkable resonances with each other. So I'm, I'm, it's quite a complicated argument, so I'm going to really read what I've, I've got, 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 got to say, because I want to try and put some content into this. And, and what I've done is I've um, put up, um, press the wrong button. That's funny. Which one is it? I made a funny noise. Why did it do that for you and not for me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll try again in a little while. All right. <laughs> um, what uh, uh, um, um, I wanted to do is I've got up some slides with some of the background information that I want to talk about, um, but I, I do want to develop a bit of an argument here. And my, my point to start with is that there are many determinants of inequality and poverty, and together we can think of them as constituting self reinforcing syndromes, which I have found it useful to think of as poverty traps. And we can think of those poverty traps as existing, uh, whether in developing countries or in highly uh, industrialized economies such as Britain's. And we would say here, I think, that access to appropriate education is key to breaking these cycles of marginalization and therefore to social justice. And universities are integral parts of national education systems, whether they're public or private institutions. What's interesting about South Africa is that it serves as a limiting case, showing both that inequality and its inevitable association with poverty, poverty is not just a matter of so-called distant strangers in a different world, and that Britain's march towards increasing inequality, encouraged by current tendencies in public policy, is both destructive and dangerous to everybody. Now, universities serve both as gatekeepers for established orders of inequality and also as transformative institutions that enable social justice through intergenerational changes in circumstances. That's a central paradox in my argument, the dual role of universities, gatekeepers, but also transformational agencies. And because of that ambiguity in the nature of universities, the current prevalent metaphor of the competitive marketplace um, is both wrong and ultimately self-defeating. The model of the market first renders a higher education qualification as a positional good, and then it devalues the currency. The consequences of where we are with that trend will be higher education's equivalent of a perfect storm, in which a new binary divide will both reverse the gains in widening participation of the past decades and the devalue the qualifications of the majority who gain admission through devaluing their qualifications to positional goods, given value by the elite status of awarding institutions rather than reflecting the achievements of graduates themselves. 
With socioeconomic category class, which we're of course not really allowed to talk about, uh, substituting for race, this future looks like South Africa in the 1980s. My argument is the future for Britain begins to look like South Africa in the 1980s, where a privileged elite qualified from a very small number of highly selective universities and a much larger number of graduates received qualifications that were heavily discounted in the workplace. Another large group didn't gain access at all. And of course, in South Africa, that was defined by race rather than by class. So let's turn to equality of opportunity. Now, equality of opportunity is one of those common places in education, often stated as self-evident, a primary value. It's also frequently assumed that it's a condition easily established and verified. At the same time, pronounced inequalities in life circumstances, household income, employment opportunities, health, housing, education, life expectancy, are increasingly being seen as an inevitable condition of the world. So when, when we do attitude surveys, uh, we find that people are disturbed by inequality, but increasingly they accept it as inevitable. Um, I think that's a contrast from the 1970s uh, and the sort of movements uh, uh, at the development of the welfare state after the Second World War. So when you do opinion surveys, people now seem to think that inequality is inevitable. So how can this rhetoric of opportunity, equality of opportunity, be reconciled with the realities of inequality? Measured in terms of household income, South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world, and the gap between the poorest and the wealthiest, the deciles, have been increasing steadily since the end of apartheid. Measured in the same way, Britain and America are, by far, the most unequal of the highly industrialized economies. Here too, inequality in household incomes has been increasing and continues to increase. Given the close link between attainment in education and household circumstances, how can there be any meaningful equality of opportunity in countries such as Britain, South Africa, and the United States? Now, much the same way that the meaning of equality of opportunity is easy to assume, but far more difficult to apply, so the concept of inequality can be understood variously. You don't have to tell an audience like uh, uh, this, that, but I'm going to anyway. Um, the issue of whether to use absolute measures of poverty is particularly relevant, relevant to the politics and therefore policies of inequality. Absolute measures, dollar a day type measures, tend to make poverty a matter of distant strangers in a third world country. Seen through an absolute lens, it may often be assumed that there is no poverty in countries such as Britain and America, or for that matter, in South Africa, which is defined by the World Bank as a middle-income country, not a developing country. Daniel Dawling's searing critique of inequality uses three criteria for relative poverty. Income poverty relative to median household incomes, lack of access to basic necessities as they are understood in a person's country today, and people's own perception of whether or not they are poor. A person is considered poor if she meets at least two of these cri three criteria that Dawling sets up. Dawling finds that 16.3% of all households in Britain today meet this definition of poverty, and 5.6% of households meet all three criteria. So, poverty in Britain is closely associated with rising inequality. Let's look at some of the stats of this. Um, anyway, hang on to that one at the moment. Um, poverty in Britain is closely associated uh, with rising inequality. By 2005, the poorest quintile of households in Britain <coughs> had one-seventh of the household income of the wealthiest quintile. This gap had been established through the 1980s, during which decade, the annual increase of household income for the wealthiest quintile was eight times the average annual increase for the poorest quintile, eight times per annum the increase, respectively 4% and half percent per annum. After 1990, this slowed down. Average increases across all quintiles began to stabilize and settled to a steady 2.5% per annum until the 2008 recession. But of course, these benefits of the long boom in economic growth were distributed as proportions of baselines that became more unequal in every year. So the consequence of that is that by 2007, 42% of all income in Britain went to only one fifth of the country's households. And that's the consequence of that combination of the constant change 
in the base percentile of which it's based. Now in South Africa, poverty and equality are inexorably linked, where a large proportion of households would meet any definition, including Dawling's set of three criteria. The complicating factor which contributes to making this country an instructive limiting case for education policies and practices is of course race. The unmistakable imprint of apartheid years has remained. Statistics South Africa reports that in 2006, the latest report available, the household income of white South Africans was 7.4 times the average income for black South Africans. Remember this in 2006, uh, which is you know, some, some very considerable time after the formal end of apartheid. As in Britain, these patterns of poverty and inequality have a direct effect on children and therefore on educational policy and educational institutions. This is accentuated by demographic structures. In Britain, the median age is 40 years. 17% of the population is below the age of 15. But in South Africa, the median age is 25, and almost 30% of the population is below the age of 15. Given high, level, high levels of household poverty, this is a potentially explosive situation. And you could, of course, extend that argument, as the more insightful uh, journalism has done, to understand what is happening across huge swathes in the Middle East at the moment, where the demographic patterns are similar. We're dealing with a crisis here in many countries, a demographic crisis of marginalized young people being excluded from higher education in large numbers. And when your demographic profile is of the sort that it is in countries such as many Middle Eastern countries and many African countries, that's a potentially explosive situation. This is apparent from patterns of achievement in the high school matriculation examination in South Africa which performs the equivalent function to British GCSEs, A-levels and vocational qualifications in managing the interface between school on the one hand and employment further and higher education on the other. And this is the, 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 the South African profile summarised for you. In 2007 there were just under one million young South Africans in the age cohort expected to write the matriculation examination. 83% of whom were African and 7% were white. 35% of the African candidates and 64% of the white candidates wrote the examination and passed. So the first hurdle in that system is even getting to the point of writing the examination. So many, in fact, don't write it at all. Of these, 34% of the white candidates achieved an endorsement, the minimum grades in specified combinations of subjects to be eligible to apply for higher education, but only 6% of the African candidates achieved an endorsement. Now, in South Africa, an A aggregate is required for the most selective university programs. Much as an A grade, uh, A grade A levels are required for entry into the most selective programs in the UK. And you can see the resonance here uh, with policies such as AAB and admission that have been introduced in this country. And here's the kicker, if you like, for those stats. Um, one in 11 white candidates achieved an A aggregate. This was matched by one in 640 African candidates. And you can see here the extraordinary effect uh, of this differential access to education. Remember, of course, what's happening in South Africa is you're now getting a coincidence of class uh, and race coming together, but you're still looking at the consequences of extreme inequality. Clearly, there's a resonance here with the tendencies of educational policies across Britain, which are tending towards this pulling apart, uh, this creation of what, I, what many people are calling a new binary divide. So obviously then poverty and inequality are clearly a syndrome that needs to be understood and analysed as such in their complexity. And one concept of this, as I've mentioned already, is the poverty trap. South Africa's education system is an integral part of a prevalent poverty trap. Post-apartheid settlement created a complex set of interests that over some two decades has continued a trend of increasing and extreme inequality within race categories. While a minority across all race categories has benefited from this, a large majority is stuck in a cycle of unemployment, very low household incomes, and little access to meaningful educational opportunity. The notion of a poverty trap. And the point about a poverty trap, uh, of which is an extensive literature, is that it doesn't matter how much you're motivated as an in individual, how much you are determined, how much you have a strength of personality, you cannot break out of it because of the structural circumstances. So it's the opposite to the notion, uh, characterised uh, uh, particularly in the United States, that every poor person somehow or other uh, should be able to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and that poverty is actually the fault of the poor person as an individual. That's what the concept of the poverty trap does. It helps us 
directs us towards uh, structural causality. When used in Britain, the concept of the poverty trap is usually understood more narrowly as a consequence of welfare policies that are over-generous and which disincentivize employment uh, or self-improvement. So when you look at poverty trap, and if you Google poverty trap in Britain, you'll actually get uh, 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 hits to notions of dealing with welfare dependency. And that's where the, the concept has in fact been misappropriated in contemporary political discourse in Britain. That's actually not the correct use of the notion of the poverty trap. Um, so while welfare, welfare policies and work incentives are obviously important, failing to apply the wider analytical concept in the context of a highly industrial economy may be disguising these important factors. And we can see that in the political discourse that actually blames welfare dependency on people themselves who are welfare dependent, rather than actually looking at structural causes as why people might get stuck in these situations. And that, I think, is a very dangerous political discourse that presents us, prevents us from looking at the underlying causality. Um, the broad dimension of the poverty trap characteristic of Britain today can be mapped from patterns of, of employment within and between generations, access to equity, the quality of housing, local services, health and access to quality education. The key issue for the purposes of this discussion is the ways in which these factors interlock with and reinforce each other. A good proxy for the combined effect of these factors is the strategic, uh, is the, um, strategic review of health inequalities in England, that's the, uh, the Marmot Review, which many of you will be aware of, a very good and important point, uh, a report on public health. Uh, the review found that premature deaths can be attributed to health inequalities are equivalent uh, to between 1.3 and 2.5 million extra years of life each year. So between one and two and a half million life years in Britain are lost to premature death as a result uh, of uh, health inequalities. And this is evident in the, uh, in the socioeconomic gradient of mortality rates, which is there. And if you look at this, might a little distance, uh, the northeast is the light green line on the top, and the southwest uh, is the dark green line below. And it shows you, basically, by socioeconomic class along the bottom, uh, what the difference in mortality actually is between those two. Um, so if you are in um, a routine, or semi-routine, which I would imagine probably corresponds to socioeconomic class five or six, you will see the difference of life expectancy in the northwest, while on the right-hand side of the graph, is sharply different uh, to that in the affluent part of the country. The Marmot Review is useful because it brings all of this together in terms of, if you like, that combined uh, statistic. So let's then turn from that background to access to education, which is our focus. Education's got a particular role in the persistence of inequality and poverty, and access to appropriate education provision is key to breaking from poverty traps, and therefore to social justice. The place that access to education plays in poverty traps in Britain is clear. One way of understanding this is in the proportion of those in the school who qualify for free school meals. I don't have to tell you that because you will have been working with those statistics professionally. Free school meals are a statutory right for pupils whose families received, receive defined benefits or have an annual gross income of less than about £16,200 £16, a year. Now, as of the last data that was available, 15.4% of British secondary school pupils are currently eligible for free school meals, which itself is quite an astoundingly high percentage. Uh, for a country that is considered to be one of the most developed in the world. Now, not surprisingly, there is a lower probability that a pupil qualifying for free school meals will uh, attend a school with high levels of, of overall academic achievement. The highest achieve, uh, achieving 10% of schools only enrolled 2.9% of their pupils from the uh, from free school meal eligible category. Independent schools charging high, high fees are self-evidently selective in this regard, but so are state schools. State grammar schools have only 2.5% of free school meal eligible pupils. And state comprehensive schools are also socially selective, with the top 100 academically performing comprehensives enrolling only 8% of their pupils uh, from free school meal eligible families, almost half the national eligibility profile. So you can see this sorting going on here. 
Uh, because free school meals is such a useful proxy for household income, you can see this sorting going on in terms of access to education. It also matters where you live. The probability that a 16-year-old pupil eligible for free school meals would have been in the lowest 20% of national examination results in 2009 indicates this. In other words, what's the probability a 16-year-old will perform at the bottom of the scale? The worst educational opportunity on this measure is in Hull, with a 68% probability that a 16-year-old will be awarded that uh, lowest uh, quintile. Um, but the highest is in Newham, London, where the probability is only 20%. So there's more than a three-fold difference in terms of that geographical filtering of text. So what you've got here is two filters operating at the same time. Uh, you've got the filter of household income that is filtering educational opportunity, and you've got the physical, you've got the filtering of, of geographical location. That is where you live, that is where you earn, and everything, every way that we look at this correlates in one way or another. And of course, what the point here is, if we go back to that rather hackneyed uh, uh, metaphor, uh, there is no level playing field for <coughs> education. Now, it can be plain, it can be claimed that universities have a progressive role providing educational opportunities on the basis of neutral uh, measures of merit. And that's what we are, if you like, supposed to believe. But this role is inherently ambiguous. While universities certainly provide life-changing opportunities, they also serve as gatekeepers, maintaining differentiation by exclusion and ranking, and contributing to enduring inequalities. That moment the last one. Pierre Bourdieu long ago showed how university gatekeeping works through the concept of a state nobility, which is a book that I always find it useful uh, to go back to. A self-perpetuating concentration of what he calls symbolic uh, cap capital. And there's a nice quote for you from Bourdieu. Bourdieu is always good uh, for a conference quote, and so I thoroughly recommend going back to him. Um, is there then an, an equivalent of what Bourdieu would call a magical shareholding in Britain today? And here, of course, research carried out by the Sutton Trust is particularly useful, uh, because although the Sutton Trust is focusing particularly uh, on universities that have no particular concern to me, um, it, it is very useful from the point of view of the focus that it has. So the Sutton Trust analysis of higher education admissions across all schools in England in 2007, 2008, 2009 showed, that a, showed a first sorting by category of school. 69% of sixth form students for non-selective state schools and colleges were offered places. 75% for independent schools and 86.4% from selective state schools. So first of all, there's a, there's a rank sorting in how many uh, are exiting from high school simply go to university at all. Then, of course, a secondary sorting takes place in terms of the category of university. Um, the 30 most selective universities took 48% of their applicants from independent schools and selective state schools, but only 8%, 18% of applicants for non-selective state schools. So there's the secondary sorting. Now, of particular interest in the Sutton Trust study is that these differences cannot be attributed solely to differing A-level results within the three school types. In a subset of 30 schools with the highest progression rates into higher education, with average scores of applicants exceeding three A-levels, three A-grades at A-level, so in other words, they equalised out the educational attainment, they created a so-called level playing field by only considering the subset uh, of applicants with the highest A-level <coughs> scores, what the Sutton Trust found was that 58% um, from non-selective schools uh, were accepted by one of the most selective 30 universities in comparison with 74% from selective schools and a stunning 87% from independent schools. And these are, remember, a subset of applicants with identical A-level grades. So just hold that figure, 87% uh, from independent schools and only 58% from non-selective non state schools. Put another way, an applicant from a fee-paying independent school has a 30% advantage in applying for a place at one of the 30 most selective universities over an applicant from a state comprehensive school with a comparable level of overall academic achievement. And that's, that, that, that is the lie uh, to the notion of there being an even uh, level playing field um, in higher education. And again, the Sutton Trust shows the sorting effect of geography. At the extreme, state pupils in Reading, Hammersmith and Fulham 
Sutton and in, in, in Buckinghamshire are more than 50 times likely to be accepted for Oxford and Cambridge than pupils from Hackney, Rochdale, Knowsley and Sandwell. More than 50 times likely. So again, it matters uh, where you live. So the whole thing hangs together in a sort of economic, political geography of the country. And, of course, when you look at it again, and this is obviously something of particular interest to me uh, in Salford, when you look at Hackney, Rochdale, Knowsley and Sandwell, you find that all of them are in the group of local authorities with uh, the highest multiple indices of deprivation uh, in the United Kingdom. So let's look at some policy directions. Will the 2011 White Paper on higher education contribute to addressing these issues? Its intentions in this respect are carefully worded, and I quote, Despite the overall successes of our higher education system in recent years, applicants with real potential are not making it through to our most selective universities. The most disadvantaged young people are seven times less likely than the most advantaged to attend the most selective institutions. This is not good enough. Individuals with the highest academic potential should have a route into higher education and the most selective institutions in particular. That actually sounds quite good from the widening participation point of view, um, but a, 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 a linguist analyzing that text would, would notice that in the phrase, in the text that I've just read out, the term most selective institutions has been used three times in one short paragraph. So what are the most selective institutions? Uh, well, they are, of course, the most selective institutions. They're the Russell Group institutions that at the moment already uh, recruit a very, uh, offer a very significant premium uh, for applicants from state schools. So the white paper and current policy centers overwhelmingly <coughs> on the policies and politics of providing access to the most selective institutions in a heavily ranked and differentiated system. So the pol the, although there's been much criticism uh, of the white paper, the white paper in actual fact is extremely consistent. Um, because the proposals that follow from that and are actually being put into practice at the moment are completely consistent with that objective. By managing and directing the allocation of individual universities, to, uh, the allocation to individual universities of student places that are eligible for loan financing, the government seeks to increase the selectivity of a small group of elite universities by ensuring that all applicants with the highest levels, the highest sets of A-level results will secure places in AAB uh, and ABB policies. In contrast, those universities that provide access to students from lower socioeconomic categories will have a substantial proportion of their student places taken away from them unless they drive down their fee levels and compete successfully with an expanding set of for-profit providers. The consequence of this policy is that those universities that have to do the most work in widening participation will have about 20% less to spend on each of their students. Now that, again, will be a painful reality to many people in this audience. Put another way, those from the more privileged backgrounds will, as a group, enjoy more favourable facilities and staff-student ratios at university than those from lower income households. There are, though, fundamental flaws in this policy. Many of these have become apparent already. The failure of universities to set their fees at the levels expected, uh, of the unaffordability of the student loan book, the mirage of a free market in which both supply and price are regulated, which is one of the strangest markets ever created. There's also a deeper paradox, though, that I want to focus on here. The inevitability that a market-centered higher education policy in Britain will devalue the qualifications of the majority of future graduates, disadvantaging both entrants from economically and socially marginalized families, and also those from already privileged groups. And the argument goes something like this. This is because for the majority of participants in higher education in highly industrialized economies, a higher education is increasingly what an economist would call a positional good. That has a value for, com uh, for competitive success in the labor market rather than for the inherent qualities that a university education uh, confers. It's the value of the certified uh, institution rather than the inherent quality of the education received. Market-centered approaches validate and accentuate this tendency. Such a positional good might be essential whether or not it also brings a private financial benefit. For most professions, a degree is an entry requirement and a wide range of jobs only open to graduates, whatever the remuneration. 
the increasing importance of the positioning power of a degree, equivalent to the significance of symbolic capital in Bourdieu's analysis, is itself a function of widening middle-class participation in higher education, which we see, of course, over the past uh, 50 or so years. In other words, the more graduates there are out there from middle-class families in the market, the less individual value uh, their qualification is as a differentiator, in other words, as a positional good in the labor market. So, taken together then, these trends, the trends of inequality and the trends of increasing middle-class participation, are begin to look like higher education's equivalent of a perfect storm. And it goes rather like this. So access to higher education is consistently a significant means to intergenerational economic and social mobility. Uh, as students from households in non-graduate professions win places at university, graduate and set up their own households. And that's very familiar to everybody here. By definition, by definition, uh, because socioeconomic uh, 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 categories are defined by the Office for National Statistics by occupational category. If you at your university recruit an applicant from socioeconomic category four, if that person graduates, they must enter in to socioeconomic category three if they get a graduate job. You have achieved social mobility simply by enrolling somebody from the lower socioeconomic category and in fact graduating them into a graduate job. So by definition, you've got social mobility. So that's, of course, what access is all about. That's driving one part of the machine. But alongside this, uh, the persistently lower rates of participation by working class families, in contrast with their middle class contemporaries, differences that themselves an outcome of the inequalities that widening participation seeks to address, means that the inherent value of higher education qualifications diminish. So on the one hand, You've got widening participation, increasing social mobility, but on the other hand, you've got ever-increasing middle-class participation, which is diminishing the value of the degree, because more and more people are using it as a positional good in the marketplace. So rather than certifying the acquisition of higher-order knowledge and analytical <coughs> skills, degrees become more important as positional goods that are used to sort job seekers in a mass graduate market. And we can see that going on at the moment. Uh, the very, very unfortunate fact that increasingly anything less than a 2-1 is not much use in the job market. The increasing evidence that comes out that some employers will only consider applicants from certain sets of universities and not other sets of universities. This is the labour market reacting to mass higher education and saying the old positional value of just possessing a degree is no longer significant. We've got to differentiate um, on other Grounds. However, and this is where it begins to look like a perfect storm, the value of positional goods is closely related to their relative scarcity. Inevitably, as rates of middle class participation in higher education rise, so the social value of investment in a university education diminishes. There is less return for employers' investments in higher pay costs in real returns. This is then reflected in the convergence of unemployment rates for those entering the workforce after secondary education. So then we get the phenomenon of a lowering at the same time of the graduate premium um, in terms of the earning power of graduates, and we begin to get the stories that come in all the time about graduate unemployment, because the value of the inherent value is diminished because more and more people in the marketplace are with a degree. And that, for anybody who's interesting in, interested in the inherent value of education, is obviously deeply distressing because it's getting into a situation where it doesn't really matter what you teach. All that matters is you hold on to the student for three years, that you're at an elite institution and they end up with a bit of paper that comes out at the other end. And no educationist or believe, person who believes in education wants to teach uh, like that. So, um, th this is, not, this is um, uh, not a paper that offers you any solution. <laughs> and uh, uh, I have... Uh, it's almost two parts of an argument, and this is only the first part. So, so what I'm going to leave you with is that is this is a sort of gloomy analysis, because it's up to you uh, to, to, to find the solutions uh, for all of that. But I do think that the challenge for all of us is to look very carefully and analytically at that situation and what the consequences of that are uh, for meaningful education. What I would hope it would do um, is to direct our attention back fundamentally to the content of what we offer in our curriculum, what education is about as an individual transformative value, 
uh, for people that changes their capabilities uh, and perceptions. And, and, and I, I'm particularly interested in this regard in Amarata Sen's work in the notion of capabilities and functionings, but I'm not going to do that because it would take another hour. But so in conclusion, and then, and then I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to take comments on the argument to try and amplify any points, just on a personal note, I, I, I first became involved in higher education leadership, leadership at the University of Cape Town in the 1990s. <clears throat> at that time, a few years after South Africa's first democratic elections in 1994, and when the country's new constitution was being framed, our challenge was the legacy of acute racial inequalities in higher education. By the end of the 1980s, when apartheid was imploding, white South Africans had the highest participation rate in higher education in the world, higher than California. Um, their degrees were conferred by a small number of highly selective universities. A considerably larger number of black South Africans were enrolled at a larger set of universities and technical colleges, for the most part unselective in their admissions. The majority of black South Africans had no access to uh, either uh, further or higher education. When I accepted the position of Vice Chancellor at the University of Salford, I anticipated, with some considerable anxiety, being faced with a very different uh, set of circumstances. I'd last been in a British university as an undergraduate and postgraduate student in the early 1970s. Uh, I left the country before something called Margaret Thatcher and everything that followed. It was all sort of a little distant image. And of course, circumstances are very different in many respects. But there are also similarities. My campus at Salford is surrounded by three wards with some of the highest indices of multiple deprivation in Britain. A significant number of families have been out of formal employment for three generations. In the high school nearest to my campus, a good school with dedicated teachers and attentive pupils, 90% of children qualify for free school meals. 90% of those children qualify for free school meals. The variation of life expectancy, remember that Marmot summary, between parts of Salford and South Manchester, which is where uh, the um, uh, footballers live, um, the life expectancy uh, between parts of Salford and South Manchester is more, the difference is more than 10 years, more than 10 years difference in life expectancy. I must tell you, that is not that different, uh, the gradient between the most affluent parts of Cape Town on Table Mountain and some of the townships uh, that you can see from Table Mountain in South Africa. In many respects, then, uh, Britain, uh, I would say, Britain today has no higher education policy. Britain rather has educational politics. With occasional bursts of activity and then commissions appointed in the year before a general election and given two years to complete their work. This, I would suggest to you, is perhaps fortunate. Let's all hope that Deering and Brown are followed by another commission in 2014 before the damage becomes permanent and Britain's future becomes more like South Africa's past. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. I'm really conscious of time. I know Martin's got to run to get a cab, but I would like an opportunity to just take a few questions. If you could come straight to the point, please. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll get through two or three questions and then we'll go to workshops. The workshops will start in about five minutes and we'll go to five o'clock. Now I'm sorry that we've had the delay but I think you have bear with us and uh, we'll try and uh, make up for that tomorrow. So who's got the first question? Say who you are and where you're from please Daniel. <laughs> Daniel Khan, Ocean, I just wonder if any of those studies incorporated the sort of Asian and uh, colored population in South Africa? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, I, I was um, the problem with giving a paper about South Africa is you have to explain so much. Um, the, 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 what, what happened after 1994 is that the uh, incoming government uh, um, maintained and continued to use the racial categories of apartheid and still does, largely, of course, to track uh, a, a change in progress. So indeed, those studies have been done using those categories. And the usual distinction, I, I've used African, African in, the, in, 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 in the generic sense, but, but the differentiation between um, 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 Asian families and families who are, who are described as coloured in South Africa um, tends to follow the, still follow the hierarchies of race under, under, under um, apartheid. So the, um, the, the, um, the participation and success uh, of uh, families of Indian and Asian origin in South Africa tends to match and sometimes exceed those of white families. 
those from populations defined as coloured uh, is less, and then the, the, the lowest participation, the ones I was using in that paper, are African South Africans. So we do have that information. Okay, thank you very much. Another question? Yeah, in the back. Linda Hancock from Deakin University in Australia. Um, I just saw some interesting data from the Institute of Fiscal Studies in the UK saying that um, now the differentiator in um, terms of equality and education seems to be participation in postgraduate degrees. So that's become the new mm -hmm. differentiator. I wonder what your comments are about the difficulties that this poses for school engagement in the wider participation agenda. Um, sorry, what the postgraduate issue or? Yes, because obviously, you know, then re it requires disadvantaged families to think about something that's been way out of their reach. Yes, um, uh, we currently have very, very little policy direction on that. Um, and in fact, almost disastrously so, because um, um, rather extraordinarily, uh, when uh, government shaped, um, shaped the, uh, the, the policy last year, they uh, rather thought that the issue of funding for master's courses for British and European Union uh, uh, students would be an issue that would only come up um, uh, around about 2015 or 2016 after the first students uh, going through the system graduated. They missed the point that having now pulled the plug um, on um, 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 the, uh, the block teaching support for taught master's programs, they've created a situation that's not sustainable. There's a great deal of concern about that. Um, Right at the moment, a, a, a student going into a master's program does not get access uh, to student loan funding um, for those programs. That they're basically upfront cash payments or cash or payments before graduation. Now, at the moment, across the sector, I think fees for British and European Union uh, uh, students in, in this country are going to go up for master's courses to at least eight or nine thousand pounds a year and possibly higher. And that's going to be something that people are going to have to pay before they graduate. They're not going to get the equivalent of graduate tax support for that. That has not been thought through. Uh, I think the consequences for um, uh, uh, students coming in who are first in family into higher education or for low-income households are profound. And of course, it's a very useful comment because you could extend my argument about positional goods and the sorting effect to exactly that. So you'll end up with the requirement being a master's qualification simply because there are so many graduates in the market. And of course, your ability to get the master's uh, qualification will probably rest on your ability to stump up between nine and ten thousand pounds a year prior to receiving the degree with no access to funding. Uh, and that, 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 that will make it, will, will be a significant factor. Thank you, Martin. I think we've got time probably for one last question before we do need to let Martin go. One last question. Come on, don't be shy. You know, you're that question, you'll regret not answer, asking it. Don't have that horrible feeling. Yeah, go on, please. Um, thank you for that, Martin. I really enjoyed it. It's very interesting. And, and the burning, it's not a properly formed question yet, but it's a question at the back of my mind is that how can these elite institutions, if you want to call them that, call themselves universities if, they, if they're buying into the system which, which privileges? a certain section of the population and doesn't fight against it. I like that argument a lot. <laughs> That's a great question. I think you should formulate that question. Um, I think there are a lot of disruptive questions along those lines to be asked, actually. And I, that's one of the, 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 if there had been a second part to this paper, which is about returning to the inherent values of what universities are, it would be exactly the sort of line of argument I'd, I'd say. Because, of course, the, the, the great achievement, um, particularly for people of my generation, um, uh, you know, was in fact that uh, the universities did cater for people from an increasingly wide range of social and economic backgrounds. And I think, I think the notion of a higher education system with uh, pre-sorting um, by a class category so diminishes the quality of the educational experience. Now, the, again, South Africa is useful in that sense because you see the, the, the direction in the, in the late, in the late uh, 80s, because of, of, of racial restrictions, you've got white South Africans with a participation rate of excess of 80% of the age cohort going into university. Now, of course, a significant number of them shouldn't be there in the first place because it wasn't right for them to be there. But what you then got was a situation that a whole university was filled by people from very, very similar social economic classes with very, very similar attitudes, highly racialized in that case, very similar worldviews, very often who'd known each other 
um, 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 because they went to the same private schools before they went to university. Further complication, of course, is that white South Africa was then segregated again by language. So you either went to an English medium or an Afrikaans medium high school. What you, what you then created was a society that was perpetuating through its university system an extremely narrow perception. Now, I, would, I think there are a number of ways of critiquing that. I, I think that's, from, from a, if you like, um, a broad sort of uh, liberal transformational viewpoint, that's inherently limiting. But it's also, in, in terms of, 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 of pure uh, uh, instrumentalist considerations of education, extremely limiting. Because you are not sharing the sort of variety of life experience that empowers people to do jobs successfully in the world. You're actually limiting their perception. So I think you do end up with an, an inherently bad education, educational system. Now, that was our heritage before. When I, when I, when I as, a, as, a, as a grammar school boy, and first in my family, went to Cambridge in 1970, and I went to my college at that stage, Cambridge colleges, as with Oxford colleges, were first of all segregated by gender, so it was entire male college. But uh, in my in, in, in my college, uh, 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 120 uh, of us were admitted in the first year. 112 of us who went in had all been to Winchester together, mm. all of them. They'd been at school since they were 12. Uh, they'd rode together. I mean, they knew they hated each other. They loathed each other. They 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 you know. Now, there's no value, there's no value educational experience in that. And, and I think those are the sorts of questions we should be asking.